Let's open our Bibles up to Acts 17. This is a pretty familiar area of scripture. I just wanted to go over, uh, read over some of this, and found some uh, stuff that related to Acts 17 yesterday. So when Brett uh, gave me a text, well, texted Josh, Danny, and I about tonight, um, I was like trying to think of what to do. So I landed on this and kind of think that uh, that'll be helpful for us to go through um, and helpful for uh, I think just the men who are here are I uh, think of you guys all as, as leaders who are in the church and they're already serving and leading and kind of uh, providing that ministry um, but we're going to look at uh, kind of Christianity's engagement with the world apologetically, or, or just, I call it apologetic engagement, the how, how Christianity really, you know, Paul here takes on um, the other worldviews, and uh, kind of just the difference that Christianity's not just one alternative among many possible worldviews, kind of like they have here their whole list of gods, and then even the we missed out on anybody, the unknown God, and uh, kind of this situation here for Paul is, well, are we, uh, is Christianity just another one that we add to the list, another possibility of kind of intellectual options? Um, and I think the answer that we already know to this is no, but Paul kind of articulates, I think, very clearly um, why that's the case, why Christianity is uh, not just an alternative Worldview, but it's the worldview that uh, that really is authoritative. That without which all other worldviews depend on Christianity to be true, and Christianity says all the other worldviews are not true. So in, <laughs> all those other worldviews have to assume what Christianity says or the Bible says to be true, and then Christianity says it's it's the truth, and there's nothing else that uh, that can compete with it. So. Um, so anyway, but let's look at kind of this passage, Paul on Mars Hill. What was the passage? Uh, Acts 17, and we'll do it starting verse uh, 16 here. Um, this is stuff you know, we've heard before, but it's sometimes nice just to revisit familiar ground. And I, I think I was encouraged the other day thinking about some of this stuff that Paul, there are, you know, rigorous defenses and evidences given, you know, for Christianity um, ultimately, the Bible is self-authenticating, all that. But Paul doesn't go through and um, he does make a very stark statement about the Christian faith, but he, he doesn't go through and give, okay, and this is why it's true, like trying to make, okay, well, here's here's why our argument is better and all that. He just tells the, the story and, you know, people um, react uh, and that's that's really up to God, their reaction, but our job is just to just to be faithful to um, tell the truth and tell what what the Bible says and what the truth is uh, about the gospel. Um, but let's start reading in Acts uh, 17, verse 16, and just kind of Paul's situation there and what he was doing. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, okay, so it's in Greece, uh, this area that uh, has some Jewish presence, as we'll see, but also... Um, it's kind of a, a center in the Gentile world. It says his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Okay, so we'll come back to that feeling that he was having. It says, so, in verse 17, he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. So he's going to the people, with the same kind of message. The Jews with the Old Testament and the, the Bible and the message of Jesus and the gospel. The God-fearing Gentiles who already um, recognize something of biblical truth. And then is evangelizing in the marketplace. Um, and first, I will just notice that Paul... Um, what bothers him and provokes him is not that he's being insulted or that his intelligence is getting insulted, but he's provoked 
because of the city being full of idols. He's, he's bothered enough to say something, not because he feels like, okay, now I have to stand up for myself, but because God's being dishonored. Um, and why don't we pause for a minute and just, just talk about that. I mean, there, and we can talk, share, you know, positives where that's come out in our own experience, or maybe negatives where we've, you know, maybe tried to defend some aspect of being a Christian for, uh, for ourselves, or, or there probably have been times where somebody has been saying something that was, what was untrue against the truth, a, a distortion of Christianity, and you felt this, this idea of being, um, provoked where it's like, I, I got to say something that even if it's not accepted, I've got to get the, the truth out there. Um, I mean, what do you, have you, what's your guys' experience with that? Maybe at work, maybe with friends, family, um, and, and kind of how do we know when we're getting defensive for ourselves versus defensive for the, the glory of God, you know, and sometimes it's a little bit mixed. I'll, I'll admit that because we're Christians, but, um, my, uh, aunt and uncle in Fresno, my dad's brother, sister-in-law, um, claim to be believers and whenever we'd go up there even at a younger age when I'd go up there and the stuff that they would say about that, the word of God or what God says or do this because that or the other right it I didn't have that much of a, a huge working knowledge of of the gospel or not the gospel of like the intricacies of uh, the Bible but I still remember it's not super like sitting well with me for some reason and as I got older, and they kind of kept saying the same, like, rhetoric, and, and you know, it's okay to be mad because, you know, Jesus was mad here. And trying to equate certain things with their own sinful natures with how Jesus was this way in this place, and they're taking things out of context. And um, there's, as I know, I know social media isn't the place, but I remember messaging uh, one of my uncle on that and my aunt and being like, guys, you can't say this and bringing up scripture and stuff like that. And I think that the reason, and I don't think it was like me getting defensive as much as it's seeing an outright, especially when you're claiming to be a believer, an outright wrong trying to justify their own sin with the Bible that caused me to not, not snap back, but just it provoked me <laughs> like, yeah. to say something because it was just outright wrong, you know? And I think that it's when you see, at least for me, when you see that there is a clear misunderstanding on the other person's part um, and a confidence in that misunderstanding that causes that to happen. And hopefully you're bringing that up to them because of, because the, of the implications of that, like, wrong teaching or wrong sharing. Yeah. What else? I think it relates somewhat, at least maybe thematically, to righteous anger, like Ephesians 5 says. And defining that as getting angry at what God gets angry at, and in the way that he gets angry, not for selfish motives or in a bitter, wrathful rage. Um, it kind of reminded me of that. Plus, Paul, he wasn't getting irritated on a personal level. I mean, they hadn't called him an idol battler yet. <laughs> He's coming up. But um, it was because he saw the idolatry. And at least in terms of personal application, like if you're asking, I immediately was like, man, when does that happen with me? Because it's often the opposite reaction. I'm not like, oh man, these poor people full of idols. I need to help them with the gospel. It's more like, Dear man, kind of idea. So, um, yeah, it's all too, not all too often, unfortunately, that this is reflected in my own heart, you know. But it should be when it's not for personal uh, insults or something like that, but for sinners, yeah. Yeah, we are going, um, when I say we, because uh, I've been going to, uh, another Bible study also um, and we're going through uh, 
first Timothy or Second Timothy, just in the false teachers and you know stuff like that, and um, and how Paul is helping or trying to encourage Timothy to um, how you confront that, you know, kind of stuff, and and um, you know the thing that keeps coming up is you know to do it in love, and so I think um, in some of the discussions was you know. Obviously, that particular relationship, you know, the relationship with that person, um, because if you hit them right away with things, you know, it could be overwhelming or overbearing, and then the, it, their defenses come up, and and then you're, and then you're now being someone too righteous, and and it can get pretty ugly, I guess, in the situation. So yeah, always. You know, with me, it's it's always you know, Lord, just give me <laughs> the right timing, discernment. What's the relationship with that person that I can you know? Because I just like having this conversation with this, my friend just now. You know, I've known him for twenty some odd years, and and he's like, I want to just come up and I want to spend some time with you, and I just want to pray and I want to confess about things, and and I'm just like, okay, yeah, well. Yeah, sure we can do that but you know I know the backstory the backstory is he's living with his girlfriend so it's like and I'm thinking okay well first yeah yeah we're gonna need to do some confessing <laughs> we're gonna be confessing about sin you know and so my thought is yeah this is what I want to say and right now obviously it wasn't the right timing for me to say those things and then I also kept thinking in the back of my how do I say certain when I do have that opportunity how do I do it and how do I do it in love so I'm I'm trying to show them scripture you know obviously I'll show them scripture but also to be like okay Dan if you're going to be serious about your relationship to Christ then we need to keep, talk about the elephant in the room you know and right. so I just I, I think um, that's the thing that I struggle with is just how do, how do you confront when you know, someone's blatantly, hmm. especially the hardest ones, I think we were saying in the group, uh, was the hardest ones is the ones that are, they sound so close to Christianity. And that's, it seems to be, I don't know if I'm sort of beating off what you were really asking for, Josh. But no. Sort of that's, um, that's always the tough one to confront those people that are, they sound so close to Christianity mm -hmm. um, that, uh, like, I just found out, I didn't even know this, uh, just but recently, but I didn't know Glenn Beck was a Mormon, you know, because the things that I, when I did listen to him, he sounded like he was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And um, and then somebody tells me, you, you, know, you know he's Mormon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, and so, um, so though that's the you know, and then how do you confront that situation and, and and do it in a way that it doesn't sound like you're, you know, holier than thou and that you're right. you're wrong and so. Yeah, that's a good point because it's like if I think, you know, what do we jump? What's our th first thing that we're gonna jump in to defend? Mm -hmm. And I think um, you bring up a good point there to not sound like we're holier than thou or that we're, you know, are we jumping in to defend something because it's it's a personal affront to us or because it's it's dishonoring to God. So it's like, okay, well, if we're defending, you know, what God says is true and God's honor and character, um, then I think that takes us a little bit out of the equation. But we all know, and I've been there too, and, you know, still struggle with this. It's like there, we're we jump in to defend, you know, political positions, all sorts of things, um, or defend ourselves, or, or you know, you, it could even be biblical truth, but we're wanting to make the argument sound more um, articulate and acceptable to the unbeliever, but it's like, but they, they're God-haters, they, yeah. they don't love the Lord, I mean, and it's not to use that as a pejorative, it's just to say that, you know, okay, we're not trying to make our, uh, our position palatable to people who don't want God, um, we're trying to defend 
God's glory. Um, yeah. Any other points on that or thoughts on this? I was thinking about like the, the examples I think about in the times I've gotten like fired up in like situations of evangelism or, or anything like that. Most of the time, I would say, and like kind of to Danny's point, you know, it's it's a shame to me. Most of the time, it, it's because I'm you know feeling personally offended at something. Um, and, and part of it's just like, you know, I think it has to do with having grown up in a Christian culture and everything like that. And then you go and you talk to people who, you know, think very different things or whatever it is. Or like, you know, in the context of like talking to Mormons or Catholics, it's like they're close, but they're they're wrong on these things. And it's like you get personally offended because it's like, um, I, I at least I feel like in my situation, I've been more personally offended for things that are just not... That I go like, well, that's just not right, and you know, and it's just not right that you think that way, and so that's what I'm getting offended at. Rather than, um, I, I, you know, I can maybe count on a finger or two the number of times that I've like tried to share the gospel because I'm actually moved by a compassion and a pity for people, mm-hmm. as opposed to just like, let's go try to win an argument of some kind, <laughs> you know. Um, mm. That's a good point. A lot of, you know, I think a lot of it's, you know, youthful zeal without knowledge kind of stuff. Um, but that's actually, I mean, like, that's something I've been praying for more in evangelism. Because I haven't had many evangelism opportunities, or, like, I have not taken many ev- evangelism opportunities in, uh, in recent days. And that's something I've been convicted over, actually, and been praying that God would put it on my heart to have that kind of compassion for people that would provoke me to actually <clears throat> say something. Yeah. Because you know, there comes those points where we're kind of like deciding, or at least I felt this way, like work or different things, or maybe it's just different situations in general, but I know particularly at work where it's like, okay, you're deciding not to say something, you're deciding to throw <laughs> one other thing out, and it's like kind of like a don't get me started, but then it's finally, all right, all right. We're saying, and then once you start, then it's it's good. You're like, okay, you know what? Now I'm committed, you know. And, uh, but it's it's the hardest to get started. So, but it, yeah, it's kind of the Lord uses those things. I think sometimes to uh, to provoke us. Uh, do you happen to have your Greek Bible there? Can you can you read us the word provoke in Greek? It is provoking. Provoking. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like par- it. it's the word. It's the word that we get um, in English. Paroxysmo. It's a word we get like a paroxysm. It's like we're just so worked up about something that you have to. A paroxysm is like that. You're like just going nuts. Like you can't contain yourself. Um, and so it's like use this word. the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never yeah, it's like the idea where it's just like you, you can't keep it in anymore. Okay. Um, so anyway, so that's what Paul is, and then so his reaction is he goes and he evangelizes. He reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and God fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. Now Paul is using reasoning, but he can use reasoning consistently because uh, he's believes the Bible and that's you know mm-hmm. God is God of truth and therefore Reasoning makes sense in the Christian worldview. But listen to uh, verses 18 and following. It says, And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. So these different schools of thought. <clears throat> and were saying, <clears throat> Danny pointed out earlier, What would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So, they're insulting Paul kind of personally as well. We'll talk about Epicureans and Stoics in a minute. But the, the idea of an idle babbler means uh, a bird who's like a, a seed picker. Um, or the idea of like, they call them like a gutter sparrow, which, you know, sometimes we have the crows out here that pick through trash just to end up with junk, you know, go through junk and take the worst parts of uh, what's in there. So they're like, oh, he just takes all the worst junk from from the uh, from these different philosophies and comes up with this, this absurd teaching. And then they say, okay, well, he's, he's saying strange deities. Uh, he's talking about this Jesus deity and this resurrection deity. Um, because in the text here, Jesus is um, 
male, the, the you know, obviously, and, and resurrection is in a feminine. So they're like, so wait, there's the Jesus God, there's the resurrection goddess. They're, so they're like not getting fully what Paul is saying. And they're, you know, kind of mocking him and insulting him because he's preaching, uh, preaching the gospel. Um, but these two worldviews here I'll explain a little bit kind of what they are. Um, <clears throat> And there's limits on what we can know about them because their their writings we don't have everything we have fragments or where they were quoted in other places, uh, but the Epicureans are uh, their highest good was pleasure. Now it doesn't mean like really like okay they were really sexually promiscuous or got drunk all the time. Their idea was that you had kind of a sensible pleasure was the highest good of life, so that you didn't try to go too far, like with drugs and sex and a bunch of things, because that could end up harming you to, or, and, and diminishing your pleasure. But their, their whole idea, their whole worldview was based on um, naturalism or materialism, um, that everything that there is, is just basically natural material. There's no soul, there are gods, but they're part of the kind of natural order of things too. And their whole like worldview of where everything came from was that it's just atoms falling through space. And at one point, there, for whatever reason, they formulated that there was a swerve, where basically there were atoms falling through space and then they swerve. And then that's what creates the idea of, uh, because if we're just atoms falling through space, then we don't have any choices. What we think is, is meaningless, it wouldn't be right or wrong, it's just, what it is it's like shaking bricks in a in a box or something it has nothing it, you know they don't become self-aware and start thinking and we don't say some of the bricks are right and some of the bricks are wrong it's just material yeah. and so they they tried to save that by saying okay at some point all the atoms they just swerved and that's what gave you free will and these decisions but so that's actually a, a kind of similar to worldviews in Arden, naturalistic materialism, which if it is true, then there's no reason to be a naturalist because the natural processes that have brought about the world obviously make some people naturalists, they make some people Christians, they make some people Buddhists. They're, it's just natural and chemical processes that make those things happen. There's no point in arguing because arguing is just a chemical reaction. There's, it's not a it's not a statement of truth or untruth. It's just stuff, and so they but they make these arguments that are that are self defeating. So they had naturalism back then. The Epicureans, the Stoics thought that the highest good was uh, was fulfilling your duty um, and enduring pain um, and kind of but you know and then living kind of like a just life, but their basis for justice. You know, our basis for justice is God's character and his word and his nature, and that that's revealed to us, and that's our standard. But if you don't have that standard for justice, then it just really becomes what a bunch of people happen to think at a certain time in a certain area. So, and really what that amounts to is just kind of a pragmatism. People just think whatever. Um, some other one day, something one day could be sort of wrong, but the next day it could be right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because, because there's really no standard there. Right? right. Because what would it be based on? You know, it's, uh, right. it's, it's, if theories of ethics are just thoughts in, in different human minds over time, mm. there's no reason for one to be superior to the other. Mm. It's just what a bunch of people happen to think. There's no qualitative difference between them. <laughs> So in Christianity, we can make sense of that. Um, and other people, even if they're not Christians, they know that to be you know, true as well, but they're not consistent in their own worldview. So that's the Stoics. Um, there are also, like some others, the, the skeptics, where they started to say, okay, well, we can't know anything to be true. Then you say, okay, well, then you should accept Christ you know, then maybe you should accept Christianity. Well, I know that's not true. <laughs> so you know, so uh, the Greeks are also dualists. Um, influence of uh, several philosophers before the time of Christ are, uh, are dualists, meaning they, they value the spiritual over the physical, which is why they're going to have such a problem with the resurrection. Um, 
and then a lot of them, there are kind of two main schools of thought. Um, one is kind of what's called the rationalist, that you can figure out the world if you sit and think about it and reason about it. The problem with that, while Paul can do reasoning because he knows the God of the Bible and he assumes the God of the Bible in his reasoning, who is truth, and we can know truth because it either conforms to or uh, doesn't conform to God's nature and character. That's how we know and justify truth. Paul, uh, anybody else who's claiming uh, that if you sit and reason, you can figure everything out, well, how do you know reasoning is valid? Well, you have to assume reasoning in order to prove it. It's, it's question begging. So it's, it's a self-defeating thing unless you believe in the God of the Bible. So they're already borrowing from the God of the Bible in order to deny the gospel and the God of the Bible. And then the other side, if you're not a rationalist, uh, you're an empiricist. Let's go out and observe everything. We, we can only know that which we experience. Um, but for that to be true, you have to assume that truth comes through observation. You can't experience it. So either so these worldviews don't meet their own standards of how you know truth, yet they're said to be true. They all have to depend on Christianity to be true. And Christianity says... None of these worldviews are true. Only, only biblical Christianity is the true worldview. So they're calling Paul an idiot for believing these things, yet their worldviews cannot be true and don't have, make any sense at all. They're self-defeating unless they depend on the God of Christianity that they deny. Um, so anyway, but it, it, go on here. He says, uh, and they took him, in verse 19, and that word there is actually... Um, more of the idea of like arrest. Now it doesn't mean like he's going to jail, but this does mean that it's like, okay, now you've got to go present your views. Okay. So they change locations here. It says, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, which is on uh, near Mars Hill and saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are proclaiming. Okay. So he says, uh, for, you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know what these things mean. Okay, so this is a situation where they, um, Paul's been brought to this area where basically um, ideas were tested to see if they were valid philosophies that could be taught, or whether they were corrupting ideas that should not be allowed. Um, back in college, I had to read a uh, famous work called The Trial and Death of Socrates, where Socrates was, uh, he was captured and taken and in this trial and, and makes these arguments, and then eventually they say, your arguments are corrupting youth, and you're going to get executed. So he sits there and argues with them, he makes a pretty good argument, and then they execute him. Um, and then he argues that it was just for the state to execute him, which is kind of interesting, too. But, uh, but so the, Paul, I think Luke is picking up on that, and he's saying, okay, this is kind of like that situation that's in that Greek literary world. But Paul is going to present Christianity and say, no, this is a totally qualitatively different worldview than all these, uh, than all these other ones. And so they, they kind of ask him, okay, so what is this new teaching that you're proclaiming? This is strange. What do these things mean? And then Luke editorializes in verse 21. He says, now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So he gives an evaluation of it. They, they used to sit there and kind of listen to, okay, what are the new philosophies? Which ones can we accept? Which ones can we not? And it was kind of, you could pick your own, uh, choose your own adventure, add gods onto your gods, you know, those different things. And so they're asking Paul, is your, are you offering a uh, new alternative worldview that we can add on? And Paul's going to say, no, I'm offering a worldview that's the antithesis of all other worldviews, uh, which is the, the gospel. Um, so it goes on in 22, it says, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, 
and said, Man of Athens, where did we get to? Oh, so uh, let me, before we get into Paul's uh, sermon here, let me uh, read a quote from um, where the Areopagus, that location that where he is. In Greek myth, it was said to be created by Apollo, which who is Mars, okay, god of war. And uh, Apollo had killed this other, you know, figure named Orestes. And so he killed him off, and basically he had, sings this song or makes this, like, chant or this poem afterward, and this is known in Greek uh, literary mythology. So basically they're saying, okay, now Apollo created this, this area called the Areopagus where Paul is uh, going to share the gospel. But the, 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 the statement that Apollo says during that time is this. He says, but when the dust has drawn up the blood of a man, meaning somebody gets killed and they die and they go into the ground. But when the dust has drawn up the blood of a man, once he is dead, there is no return to life. That's the same word here for resurrection. Once a man dies, there's no resurrection. But Paul's there talking about Jesus and the resurrection. So they said, okay, this, you know, you're standing at the place where Apollo, the God Mars has said, created this place and said there's no resurrection. Paul's about to preach the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so listen to what he says here. We'll just walk through this uh, fairly briefly here. He says, that, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Man, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So we'll stop there for a minute. But um, so he notices first he, when he talks, he says, okay, I observe that you're religious. That word religious is kind of the positive connotation. The negative connotation we would say is, is like superstitious. Mm -hmm. And I think the word, the idea of the word is kind of in between there. It's like, okay, you have an appreciation of the supernatural, mm. but it's all wrong. And so he says, look, and I went through and I looked at all your objects of worship, and you even have one for the unknown God. You know, um, the, the Greeks and the Romans, uh, they believed in many gods. The Christians were said to be atheists because they only recognized um, one God as the uh, one true God, the creator of all things. Um, but the Greeks even thought that their gods kind of uh, morphed and evolved and things like that, that they were, they were created as well. They believed at some level there was one trans the possibility of one transcendent God who was unknown and unknowable, that you couldn't possibly... Um, know him, that he wouldn't have anything to do with human affairs, he wouldn't have anything to do with the, the created world. Um, the philosopher Plato even said, and I'll read a quote from him, he says, now to discover the maker and father of the universe were a task indeed having discovered him, to declare him unto all men were a thing impossible. Basically, even if you could know who the true one God was, you could never explain him to other men. Okay, but Paul's about to say, okay, you have this altar to the unknown God. Let me tell you uh, really who the unknown God is. In fact, you can know him. In fact, you do know him. He already, he's the God who's the creator, and you already know it. Um, verse 24, he says, so, and then we'll just make some points here. I think that uh, these are points that I think we need to emphasize in our evangelism and apologetics. One is that God's the creator. So he says first in verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Okay? So number one, God's the creator. He made heaven and earth. He created everything. He made everything. He owns everything. He is um, he's uncreated. He's transcendent. He's not part of his creation. He's not the sum total of his creation. That's what pantheists say, that, that if you add up everything that exists together and view it as like a compound thing, that's what we call God. And so God's always, in a, little, a, a little bit in each of us type of thing. Paul says, no, that, 
the God who created everything is the true God, the one who made heaven and earth, who was not uh, created, which we'll get onto. And also that he's, uh, you can put there that he's the sovereign Lord in verse 24. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, that God's in charge of everything, that God rules over everything. Um, and that's why we have things in the world that appear random, and yet we also have stability. That God, uh, think about human decision-making and how pointless human decision-making would be if the world really did just depend on chance and randomness. Your decision to do things or try to do an action to get a certain result may work one day, may work not work the next day. So we're used to gravity every day, but tomorrow, okay. maybe not. Maybe gravity doesn't work the same way. Because if it's really just random, you know, how things work out, then you have no, our decisions are meaningless. They don't have any point. They're, they only make sense when the sovereign God rules his creation. Um, but anyway, so he says, and then he is, Paul's location is near uh, one of the Greek temples where they have all their gods. And so you can kind of imagine him saying, God doesn't dwell in, a tem in temples made with hands, meaning God's not subject to the limitations of where humans try to house gods and then try to worship them. Uh, and he goes on, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So this is another, that God's transcendent, that God's independent, that God is solitary. He's, he's not created. He, he's eternal. He needs nothing. Everything else depends on him. He depends on nothing and everything uh, is from him. If you think of uh, Romans eleven thirty six, for all things are from him and through him and to him. Um, and there's another verse, we'll not look it up for time, but in Jeremiah 10.10, 10, Jeremiah is talking to Israel and he's saying that he's talking to Israel about how to interact with the people of the land and the people who don't acknowledge the Lord. And he, he's saying God's the only true God, the everlasting king. It's the Lord. He's the creator of heaven and earth. And then he switches languages and says, say to the nations, in Jeremiah 10.10, 10, he switches to Aramaic, which is the language the Hebrews talk with the nations in. And he switches and says, tell them this phrase. He gives them an ap apologetic. He says, the gods who did not make heaven and earth, meaning the, the idols that man has created, the gods who did not make heaven and earth will perish under heaven and earth. Basically, they're, not, they're creations of man. They're not the sovereign creator which is the God, true God, the God of Israel, is what Jeremiah tells them. And Paul's using a similar argument here, that God gives life and breath to all things. He's not in need of man. He's not in need of his creation. Okay, and in verse 26, it says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their hab habitation. So God overruling his creation and he says that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him. That's the idea of walking around blind somewhere. Grope for him uh, and find him, though, they would, uh, though he is not far from every one of us. So it's been said that like man doesn't want to find God just like a criminal doesn't want to find a policeman. You know, that, idea, that word for uh, grope, like trying to find something in the dark, um, is actually used in... The Odyssey, you know that book that we had to, we were all supposed to read in high school. Um, the you know that Cyclops that shares an eye or whatever, or that is looking around for his eye at some point. That that word is used there. He can't find you know the thing that allows him to see. Um, but anyway, he goes on. So it's like okay, everybody's looking for God, but they're looking kind of where they know they can't find this God, the one that is the creator to whom they're accountable, and the God that. Uh, that they owe their, their worship and allegiance. So it's like, okay, they're kind of try, trying to find God, but not. Uh, but then here's kind of the judgment that he is not far from each one of us, meaning we know he's the creator. We know, we know these things about him. These are self-evident. And then he's, uh, Paul says, for in him, again, our dependence on God, for in him we live, 
the living God. We move and exist. So God is the one who gives us our existence, our being. It says, and even some of your poets have said, for we are also his children. Okay, so he quotes some Greek poets there and says, look, you guys kind of get at the truth, but you, you deny fundamentally the God who, uh, that it points to. And so he says, being then the children of God, this is a key statement here, uh, and I think this is one that we can use uh, apologetically quite a bit. It says, being then children of God, and this means children of God, not by grace, you know, this means just we're his general creations. We ought not to think that the, the divine nature, that which makes God God, is like gold or silver or an image formed by the art or thought of man. So that's a key statement there. Why would we think, since we're created by God, we're God's children, in, in being his creations, it's a mistake, it's idolatry, to think that God is something that we can control, create, and manipulate by the art or thought of man, meaning something that we create with our own hands, like an idol that's from our own from the creation, or the, something that we make up in our minds. Um, and I've heard this uh, quite a bit from talking with unbelievers and unbelieving co-workers and different things. That, well, I wouldn't want to worship a God who does X, or my God wouldn't do this or that, but it's like, but there's a built-in foolishness in that statement. I wouldn't want to worship a God who does X, says nothing about the existence or not existence of that God who does things you don't like. Or, my God would never do that. But it's like, okay, now your God is conformed to whatever you would do or not do, what you would allow and not allow, and therefore you, you're admitting that your God does not exist. You're admitting your God is only based on your, as far as your thoughts allow that God to have limits and extents. It's not a God you, uh, it's a God you get to rule and make in your own image, but not a God who, who rules over you and who's the creator. Yeah, that your God wouldn't do those things because God doesn't exist. Um, but that you'd be surprised. Well, actually, I don't know if you guys would be surprised, but it's it's that common an argument, even though it's a pretty, I mean, self-evidently wrong argument. I mean, I, but it is very common to people to say, well, I, I would reject this God because of these reasons. And it's like, but that really doesn't say anything about who God is his existence, his nature or character, that just says what you find acceptable and not acceptable, and that assumes that the individual human is the authority on, on whether or not God uh, exists. Right. Right? It's like, okay. Um, and so anyway, but they, so people, people tell on themselves, you know, they, they do. We, um, and it's not a matter of pride. I mean, the Lord opened our eyes to see these things uh, and to put faith in Him. But uh, but Paul's walking them through their the own their own um, foolishness of their arguments. That it's not that Christianity has is a worldview, and there's these other worldviews, and that you see. Okay, now we're going to show some evidence for Christianity and some evidence for the these other worldviews. It's that. These other worldviews are self-defeating. They they can't uh, be consistent because they they lack what Christianity has, which is the authority of God's truth that's based on God's nature and character. Um, so anyway, then Paul gets to the conclusion here. We'll finish up here. He says, "So so what do you do with this? I mean, so Paul just tells him all this stuff. Okay, this is who God is. No, Christianity is not just an alternative worldview." It's a worldview that does, disallows all other worldviews and shows them to, to not, be, uh, not be possible, not be workable. Um, and so he gets to the conclusion here, and I think this is a good example for us because I think sometimes we can do an internal critique of other worldviews, but then you've got to get to the uh, kind of the application for people as well. Verse 30 
It says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, meaning God was kind of merciful in that way, he says, God is now declaring to all to men that all people everywhere should repent. Meaning people say, oh, I don't like God for these reasons, therefore God doesn't exist. Well, no, you need to repent. We need, yeah, we get that people don't like God. It's not that they don't know who God is or that they don't, uh, they, they can't believe in him because there's not enough evidence. It's that people naturally hate God and they need to change. God doesn't need to change to conform to them. They need to change. They need to repent. They need to change their, their attitude, change their heart toward God and recognize that God is the standard of right, that God is the standard of truth. So he tells them that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day, meaning God's going to hold man accountable because he's the creator, he's the sovereign Lord, he's the ruler, he's the judge. And so he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof by raising him from the dead. So he doesn't say here at any point like, okay, here's proof for the resurrection. He's saying the resurrection happened and it's proof that God's going to judge the world because the pattern is people die, they go into the ground, but now Jesus has come back out of the ground and is alive and he says now that he's reversed the whole course of the way things go, he's the one who's going to be able to judge everything. Um, and in, in Greek myth, um, that whole statement Apollo said after death, there is no resurrection. Uh, the guy Apollo killed after, before he, you know, right before he said that, that guy goes and kind of wreaks havoc in the like spirit world and everything. So imagine the fact that Paul is like knowing that and saying, yeah, but Jesus, after he died, he came back from the dead, meaning that he's the one who's really going to bring judgment. He's the one who can really, he's the one who reversed history. And now he gets to be Lord of both the living and the dead. Um, so now he says, look, he, and he doesn't give all these, you know, all the reasons, which there's, you know, plenty of evidence for uh, that can be encouraging to Christians um, and used in a proper way. But he doesn't say, well, the swoon theory, you know, where Jesus, some people think that he, he didn't really die on the cross or something. He doesn't, say that he says no the resurrection actually proves that god is going to judge the world and therefore you need to repent having furnished proof by raising him from the dead now look at the reaction this is kind of the point here of you know how people will handle this it says now when they heard the word resurrection apollo said after man's blood goes into the ground there is no resurrection this is where they couldn't de deal with it anymore when they heard the word resurrection of the dead some began to sneer, but others said, we will hear you again concerning this. I Meaning, let's talk about it later. Let's, let's push it down, eschatological uh, thing. And so some people totally rejected it. Some people said, can't really handle this right now. I don't have an answer for that. Let's talk later, you know. Um, and then, so verse 33, so Paul went out of their midst. It says, but some joined him and believed. Among these, and it even gives us their names, Dionysius, uh, the Areopagite, so somebody who was there, part of that system, and a woman named Maris and others with them. So, pretty simple. I mean, uh, it's not stuff that we don't know, but I think it's stuff that um, sometimes we get a, a little bit too deep into the weeds. I think it's sometimes good to just come back to these basic um basic truths of that Christianity is true, and here's the reasons why God is the creator, why he's the Lord of everything. Here's the re you know, uh, I think the temptation sometimes is to offer Christianity as just a, um, we live in a time of intellectual choice, where it's just like, I, there, there are good aspects of that too, but, um, but sometimes people think that, well, you know, one Worldview is just as good of another. It's just what kind of you feel like, uh, what you feel like doing. But I mean, seeing that Christianity uh, engages the world and other worldviews in such a way to show that no, it it's the only one. It's the only, uh, it's the only way that the gospel 
um, undermines all other worldviews and, and leads to that conclusion. Um, and we also see, you know, people sneered, mock Paul, and, and or said we're going to push it off to later, and uh, and those oh, and some believed, and those will be the reactions. Um, but he doesn't sit there and say, well, wait, no, no, there's, uh, there's, uh, let me tell you about near-death experiences or something, and you know, try to give you some more evidence. He just he lays it out there because the uh, proclaiming and defending the gospel is is not always to make ourselves feel better that we gave a smart argument. It's more to uh, be faithful to proclaim who God is and what he's done um, and to warn people, warn people of what's coming that they need to, uh, need to repent. But anyway, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer and then finish up here. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Um, Lord, we know that your word is truth. We pray that you would allow us to handle it faithfully. We pray that, uh, that you would allow us um, wisdom, but that you would put us in situations where, like Paul, we are provoked not to defend ourselves, but provoked to uh, defend your truth. And Lord, that you would help us to do that in a way that is consistent with your word and that puts you and your gospel on display as the only true worldview that undermines every other worldview, uh, and that that points to you as the uh, as the only true God, Lord, and and your glory. So, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.